Well, it seems uh, a bit like forever for me, even though it's only been two weeks that uh, I had asked Pastor Allen to fill in. I know, Mandy, you're running back to go live. I'm, I'm not officially starting yet, so you're good. Uh, but uh, grateful for that window of time that uh, I might get a little healthier since the last I had the opportunity to, to preach. But now having had two weeks off, uh, I feel like that gives me license to preach longer, uh, to make up for the two weeks that I missed. And for all those folks that are just getting back from Florida who have missed my preaching for the last couple months, I have to make up time for them. So I'm going to preach for probably at least uh, a week and a half today. Uh, so we'll get out of here about uh, Wednesday of the week after Easter. So just let you know that ahead of time. Well, how many folks in the room, I mean, I can see, but how many folks in the room are willing to confess that they, they have to wear corrective lenses of some kind? They're either wearing glasses today or contacts. Well, that's more than half of the room. Well, you are not alone. If you don't know any of the history of, of actual corrective lenses, they have been in use since about the mid-1200s. So lots of folks down through the years have had to wear glasses for one reason or another. And there's actually some archaeological evidence, some historical evidence that say that there were efforts to have corrective lenses of varying kinds that even existed before the 1200s. Me personally, I have been wearing glasses since the seventh grade. Uh, my lovely wife, Wendy, has been wearing hers since kindergarten. Well, the, the fact that I wear glasses is not a new thing for you. you. You obviously have known that I've worn glasses. But what you may not know is that without my glasses, especially my left eye, I cannot read the big E on the eye chart. <laughs> just can't. I mean, I, it's not that it's a little blurry. I can't even tell it's a letter on the eye chart without my glasses. So for me as, as your pastor, uh, if I decide I want to try and like, make some kind of significant point and I want to take my glasses off and like, look thoughtful before you, well, that's nice as a gesture, but the problem for me is, is I take my glasses off and all of your faces disappear. I can't even, I mean, I can kind of see Mandy has eyes, uh, but that's about it. Uh, you know, Joe, if he didn't have his, his goatee beard kind of thing, I wouldn't know where Joe's mouth is. And even worse than that, not only can I not see you, which is a little bit of a less of a problem, I look down and I can't read a lick of my notes or I can't read my Bible without my glasses. So I can't make those cool gestures without them. Because that's how my vision is. Uh, my vision is such, especially in low light, that it's even worse. So every night when I go to sleep, I lay my glasses in the same location on the dresser. Because in the night, if I had to get up and find my glasses, I couldn't see them. So I have to go where I, I know them. Wendy can attest to this because there's been more than one occasion where I have taken them off at home, like after a run, I'll come home and I'll take them off and lay them down somewhere, and then I can't find them because without my glasses, I can't see. Now, I said all that to say this, that the issue is not do I have some measure of vision because the answer is yes, I have a measure of vision without my glasses, but without my glasses, I can't really see. So having vision and being able to really see are not the same thing. Well, maybe you don't wear glasses. Maybe you can't really quite relate to my level of blindness without them. But there are lots of things in life that fool or trick our eye. And you may be familiar with some of these next pictures. So I'm going to have Cole put them up on the screen here. Here's a couple optical illusions. What do you see in the picture on your left? Anybody? Okay, I heard both answers. I heard somebody say faces. And I heard somebody say a vase, because that's how optical illusions work. How about the, the picture on the right? What do you see? Okay, ducks. Okay, there we go. So you can either see ducks or you can see rabbits. And, and the thing is, is that you'll see what you want to see. If I tell you that those are ducks and you look at that picture, even if you said rabbits before, you'll go, okay, yeah, I see ducks. But if I say, no, those are rabbits, you'll look at it for a second and go, yeah, those are rabbits, because those are the rabbit ears. That's how optical illusions work. They trick our eye. We have vision, but we don't really see. How many remember magic eye from like the, the, the 80s, 90s? A, a couple people. Okay, if you don't recall what magic eye is, they were pictures just like that with all these random colors on it that look like nothing. But with the right skill, there are actually pictures hidden in there. And they're actually three-dimensional pictures. So it's kind of a cool thing, but our eyes are fooled. They're tricked. 
Now, maybe that's a little bit too difficult for you. So maybe this next picture uh, is something that you can remember at least with your kids, the old hidden item pictures. How many can remember going to the doctor's office or the dentist's office and there was the highlights magazine? Somewhere in the highlights magazine was a hidden picture puzzle for your kids to do. So somewhere in there, the bottom of the picture, there's like a worm and an envelope and flags and a house. Those little pictures are somewhere embedded in that bigger picture. But our eyes can be fooled, and without the right focus, we'll miss seeing what we need to see. You don't always see what you expect either, and that's a bit of a problem. Now, what does that have to do with Palm Sunday? What does that have to do with my text today? Well, for those first folks who witnessed Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on that first day that we now call Palm Sunday... They had vision, but it was not a guarantee they would actually see what was going on. And here's why that was not a guarantee for them. Here's a second kind of key truth or lens to view our time together today. And that's this, that heaven's purpose is always greater than earth's expectation. Sometimes we don't see because we enter into a situation or a circumstance, we enter into perhaps a text like we will read today, and we have a set of earthly expectations. And because of those earthly expectations, we will miss heaven's purpose for us. So with those things in mind, I'm going to invite you to take a Bible and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. If you don't have a Bible, you'll find one there in the rack in front of you. If you've got a smartphone or a smart device, got a Bible there, you're welcome to turn whatever is most convenient for you. Matthew is the first of the New Testament, so first book of the brand new te- of the New Testament. It is the first of what we call the Gospels. We're looking at the 21st chapter of Matthew's Gospel. I don't do this very often, and it was a, a practice of the ancient church that when God's word was read, especially the Gospels, they would stand in, in honor of God's word and in respect for the gospel. So would you stand with me this morning as we look to Matthew's Gospel and begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 21. And when they approached Jerusalem, meaning Jesus and his disciples, and had come to Bethphage, the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them and brought the donkey and the colt and laid their coats on them, and he sat on the coats. Most of the crowd spread their coats in the road, and others were cutting branches from the trees, spreading them in the road. Crowds going ahead of him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he'd entered Jerusalem, all the city was stirred, saying, Who is this? And the crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer but you are making it a robber's den. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done, the children who were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babes you have prepared praise for yourself? And he left them and went out of the city of, to Bethany and spent the night there. And not only did the ancient church stand for the reading of the gospel, at its conclusion the reader would say, this is the word of the Lord, and the church would respond by simply saying, 
Thanks be to God. So church, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Palm Sunday is today. And we're going to look at this picture of Palm Sunday. And typically when we look at a picture, when we want to try and focus on something, we create a frame for it. And you've probably done this before. So take your left hand, make your L. Okay, I want you to hold it up. I'm going to see your hands. Take your right hand. You've got a backwards L. And all you've got to do is just slide your thumbs together. Okay, now you've got yourself a frame. To frame pictures. In fact, you could turn to your person to your left or to your right and say, wow, that's a fabulous picture. It's a beautiful picture. We frame things. If you want to get really, really creative, you could take one of your hands and turn it upside down, and then you've got really cool frames and do all kinds of stuff. But we frame pictures to give us focus. Well, the frame for this day that we call Palm Sunday is actually a frame that exists in all four Gospels. All four Gospels don't always contain all of the exact same content, but all four Gospel writers felt this was such an essential part of Jesus' life and ministry that they chose to tell this story. So we're going to find it framed today, not only in Matthew's Gospel, but in the other Gospels as well, and I'm going to draw a little bit from them. As I have told you often in the past, there are no meaningless details in God's Word. Words are important, so the details of this story are important. And how we look at this story, how we frame it, can determine whether we see or whether we only have some measure of vision. Now one way we can view this story is simply from the Passover frame. Passover is a feast that God instituted with his children all the way back when they were in bondage in Egypt, if you're not familiar with that story. Moses was God's deliverer that he sent to Pharaoh to let his people go. And uh, at the close of that experience, God commands his people. So part of this last act that God is going to do to change Pharaoh's mind, he instructs his people to take a lamb, a perfect lamb, and set it aside. And then they were to sacrifice that lamb and offer it to God as an offering and to take the blood of that lamb and paint it over the doorposts of their homes. And when the angel of death came in the night, the angel of death would pass over homes that were under the blood of the lamb. That's what we celebrate when we talk about Passover. That's what the Jews celebrate as a part of Passover. It happened to take place on the 14th of a particular month. What month is not a real big deal. The issue of of 14 is important, and you're going to hear why in just a moment. The waving of palm branches, which our kids and some of our not kids did as they processed around the room today, that is actually a part of God's instruction for the celebrating of Passover. It was a way that they expressed joy in God's deliverance. It's a way that they remembered God's deliverance. And so when you hear of palms being waved in Matthew's gospel, it's just a part of the Passover frame that they were understanding because Palm Sunday takes place on the eve of the Passover feast. In fact, in one of the other gospels, it says that as the folks gathered around, they had gathered in Jerusalem for the feast, Then they recognize that Jesus is here and they go out to meet him and they escort him into the city. They've come for Passover. Palms are a part of that. Even what they say in Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That word Hosanna actually means save now. And it's a part of this remembrance and celebration of God's great deliverance all the way back in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus. In fact, it's Exodus 12, if any of you want to go and read about Passover and, and so forth, it's there. Passover is the 14th day. Palm Sunday is the 10th day of the month. Why does that matter? Because in God's instruction about Passover, the 10th day is the day that God's people were called upon to set aside the lamb for the sacrifice the lamb whose blood would be the covering for them, is set aside on the tent. It's the Passover frame. But this day is not Passover yet. But these details are important. 
But there's a second frame. Because in our earthly vision, we can simply focus on, and I'm not trying to diminish the importance of the Feast of Passover for God's people and what it points to, but there's a second frame, and it's actually heaven's frame. It's the redemption frame. Passover points to something beyond just a simple feast. For you see, God has been setting the stage for an ultimate deliverance from the very moment that Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. There is words of, of God in those early chapters of Genesis where God says that though you have sinned, there will come a day where I will send a deliverer to you who will ultimately take care of this sin issue. Passover points to a greater reality. God does not leave deliverance or a deliverer to chance. In fact, if you still have your Bible open, if you would just go back one chapter in the book of Matthew, and we look in chapter 20 in verse 18, uh, we hear Jesus speak these words to his disciples. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, hand him over to Gentiles to mock, scourge, crucify him. And on the third day, he will be raised up. See, Jesus is not just haphazardly showing up on Palm Sunday for the Passover. Jesus is intent on coming to Jerusalem because he knows that God has a plan and a purpose greater than a simple Passover frame. There is the redemption frame. What vision do you have? Can you see? There is heaven's purpose and there are earth's expectations. You see, if we look at this simply from earth's expectations today, for the people that were there at that day when Jesus rode into town, Palm Sunday begins as a, a, a week of great expectation that for most of these folks who are gathered here in this day only ends in great disappointment. You see, it's a bit like that optical illusion slide I had earlier uh, unless you change your focus, you will not see the picture that you need to see. They had a focus of earthly expectation that caused them to be misaligned to God's purposes. Their eye was fooled. It was misfocused. They only saw what they wanted to see. And what did they want to see? Well, here's some confusion they have. Verse 10 in Matthew's gospel says, the whole city asked, who is this? Somebody has just ridden into town, there's been this big commotion, and they want to know who it is, and the people say, well, this is a prophet, this is Jesus, a prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Their vision was focused simply on an earthly prophet, not on the Messiah who had come to save them from their sins. They were looking for the wrong kind of king. They were looking for a king that would sit on an earthly throne. So here's a picture of a throne just to remind you of that. Even the words that they're singing in that Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, you know, the, the, you know, this connection to David, these are words that point to an earthly kingdom. If we were to go from Matthew's gospel, just one book over to Mark's gospel, in the 11th chapter we find Mark's recording of the triumphal entry on this Palm Sunday. Mark gives a little bit more detail when he says, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then verse 10 of Mark's gospel, chapter 11, says, Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. They were looking for the wrong kind of king. When they lay their coats down before Jesus and allowed Jesus to ride over them, that's not just a meaningless detail in the story. This is actually an action of submission. It's as if you would have laid yourself down in front of the king and said, King, you can walk right over me because I recognize you as king. I'm your subject. I bow myself before you. But they're looking for the wrong kind of king. They are looking simply for an earthly deliverer and an earthly deliverance from Rome. God's people, the Jews, at the time of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, are a people living in a position of weakness. They are under the authority of the Romans. 
They are not in a place of power, but they are desperate for earthly power. They are desperate for prestige. They are desperate for access. They are asking themselves or saying to themselves, if only, if only a king will come, we will be free from all of this oppression. And so they are longing for an earthly king. They are longing simply for political power. It's an earthly expectation. And what is the resulting reality of that? Well, the very same people who on this day are crying, Hosanna, blessed is the king. Just a few short days later, if you know the story, they are now crying out before Pilate, we have no king but Caesar. Looking for the wrong kind of king. And just like them, we are very happy for Jesus to be king as long as he does what we expect him to do. As long as he does what we want. We misunderstand his lordship. We misunderstand what his kingship means in our life. You see, I fear that we are wanting Jesus to come, whether it's on Palm Sunday or Easter or just into our lives on any given day. We want Jesus to come just to make our life better. We want him to come just to make our life more successful, make us more popular, put us in a place of power, prestige, and recognition. I know many in the church that I think are still looking for an earthly king. Oh, if only we had the right leader in the United States, the church would return to a place of power and prominence as if that's what God intended for us. It's earthly expectations. So what does God want us to know? Well, here's the thing about Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is an incredible parable of the lifelong mismatch of what we think we need versus what God has provided. It's a different frame to look at this picture. Now make no mistake, in heaven's purpose, Jesus comes on this Palm Sunday as king. There are other times in Jesus' ministry where he instructs people and he instructs the demons that he casts out to not tell anybody who he is. But on this day, Jesus does not say, don't tell anybody I'm a king. Jesus does not deny his kingship or his kingdom. The text in Matthew says that he comes in direct fulfillment of Scripture's promise that there is a king coming. Talking about the, the, the donkey or the colt that Jesus would ride on. Daughter of Zion, be encouraged, your king is coming. Jesus comes and has come as king. Oh, but what kind of king is Jesus? Jesus comes as a new kind of king. Everybody say new. Jesus comes as a new kind of king. And how do we know that he comes as a new kind of king? Well, when Jesus rides into Jerusalem, he has no royal procession of conquering army before him. He comes with no spoils of war. He comes with no golden scepter in his hand. And he does not go to the palace or to the court. He's a new kind of king. He is also not accompanied by, as I said, the armies and perhaps the prisoners that he has taken captive. No, when Jesus enters the city, he's accompanied by the common people. Not even the leading people of the city. He's accompanied by commoners. He's a new kind of king. When he rides in, he does not ride in a chariot. He does not even ride in a royal steed. Scripture in Matthew and the other Gospels record that he rides on a common beast of burden, a donkey or the colt of a donkey. And not only is it a common beast of burden, it's not even his. He has to borrow it. He is a new kind of king. If you were to go to Isaiah's gospel in the, or Isaiah's prophet, prophecy in the Old Testament and look in the 53rd chapter, you find words that have a heading over top of them that are called the suffering servant. And these prophetic words about the coming of Jesus says that he will have no form 
or appearance that we will be attracted to him. There will be nothing about the coming of this king that will make you go, wow, that's the guy, he looks so fabulous, and look at his entourage. That's the kind of king I want to follow. No, Jesus comes. It's a new kind of king, and that is important for us to know. When he comes, he goes to the temple and not to the palace. And this is important for us to note. Again, details are important. Why does Jesus go to the temple? Because as a new kind of king, his kingdom is not the same as the earthly kingdom that the people were looking for. It is a spiritual kingdom. It's an important detail in this event. So let's go back to Matthew's gospel and take a peek at that again. Matthew chapter 21, we're actually going to look starting in the 12th verse. Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 12. Jesus enters the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple, overturned the table of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves, said to them, it's written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a robber's den. Verse 14 is really, really important. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple. Note when this happens. It's after Jesus has casted out the money changers, the seller of doves. That's when the blind and the lame have access to God. Jesus healed them, it says at the end of verse 14. This new kind of king will have no rival in his spiritual kingdom. So when he goes to the temple... God and God alone who should be in view, not the selling of wares and the cheating of people by having prices that are higher than they should be. God's house is to be a house of prayer. And when Jesus sets that balance aright, then the blind and the poor, the lame can come and they can find healing. And it says the children are running around the temple and they're singing songs of praise. That is this new kind of uh, place, this new kind of king that we find in this passage. But verse 14 picks it up a little bit more, and here's one last little piece that points to this new kind of king. So look with me at verse 14, or after verse 14. Actually, I want to go to uh, um, Luke's gospel. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong spot. Let's go to Luke's gospel, chapter 19. Luke's Gospel, chapter 19. This is where Luke records the events of Palm Sunday. Luke is the only one who records this little piece of important stuff. Because it's so important about who Jesus is. It talks about the kind of king that he is. So Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, beginning of verse 41. Jesus, when he approached Jerusalem, he sees the city... And he wept over it, saying this, If you had known this day, even you, the things which make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For the day will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Jesus, as this new kind of king, sees the city of Jerusalem, and he weeps over it. And why does he weep over it? Part of the reason he articulates here is that Jesus, knowing all things, knows that there's going to come a time historically when enemies to the city are going to come, and they're going to camp around the city, and they are going to lay siege to it, and they are going to destroy Jerusalem. So Jesus weeps over the destruction that is to come, but part of the reason that Jesus weeps over that is because Jesus understands that that destruction comes not just because there are bad people out there. That destruction comes because it is a result and evidence of the sin issue that exists in the world. Those people will come and destroy Jerusalem because sin causes people to do all kinds of terrible things. But even more than just the physical destruction of a city, Jesus weeps over the city of Jerusalem as this new kind of king because ultimately he understands that they have missed God's redemptive work in this moment. They are blind to it. They have vision, but they do not see, really. They only see what they want to see. And because of that, Jesus weeps over them. 
Jesus came in peace to give people peace, but they preferred salvation from taxation to salvation for their souls. Those are the words of Paul Wallace in a book about Palm Sunday. Jesus weeps over them because they preferred salvation from an earthly perspective as opposed to salvation for their souls. Only a new kind of king weeps over his city. New kind of king, new kind of kingdom. It's an upside down kingdom. The Gospels are full of Jesus' instruction about this upside down kingdom. If we backed up again in Matthew's Gospel, just went back to the, the 20th chapter and we looked at verses 25 through 28. Jesus is talking to his disciples about the kind of leaders that should be a part of God's upside down kingdom. He says the Gentile leaders, well, they lord things over you. They put, your th- they put their thumb on you and they hold you down. But Jesus says that ought not to be in my kingdom. In fact, the one who wants to be first is going to be last. And the one who is last will be first. It's an upside down kingdom. Matthew, or Mark's gospel in the 8th chapter, Jesus says that anyone who wants to uh, gain life needs to lose it for the sake of the gospel. In fact, he says that uh, it, it, what, what profited a man if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? It's an upside down kingdom. In Corinthians, in Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, he, he tells them that God has chosen the foolish things of earth to shame the wise. The, it, it's foolishness to people of earth, but it's God's purpose. It's God's perspective. It's contrary to what earth's expectations are, but it's the exact thing that is needed. Some are waiting today for someone to come from the halls of Congress or from the floor and chambers of Senate to bring deliverance. They're waiting for the right person in the White House, for the right legislation. And I am here today to tell you, church, or anyone uh, that is in this room or watching us online, that the only real revolution that matters is the revolution of the heart that Jesus came to bring to us. He came to bring it to those who were there on that first Palm Sunday, and he comes to bring that same revolution of the heart to you and I today. But we must lay down our earthly expectations and embrace heaven's purpose. Because heaven's purpose is always, say always with me, church, always. It is always greater than your earthly expectation. I am here today to tell you that there is no earthly law, there is no earthly form of government, there is no country in the world that you can live in and under their rule and reign that will be better than what God has for us in Jesus Christ. Amen? That is heaven's purpose, but we have to lay aside earth's expectations. We must live in an upside down kingdom with a brand new kind of king. So my questions for you this morning as we close. Are you willing to allow Jesus to come and rule and bring salvation not by taking power and killing, but by losing power and dying? Because that's exactly what Jesus comes to do and came to do in this Holy Week. So... How is your vision today, church? That's my question for you. When was the last time you had your vision checked, your spiritual vision? What are you looking for or waiting for today? Are you just merely waiting for Jesus to ride into your circumstance today and just wave a magic wand and fix stuff for you? And then once he's done that, you're just going to go on your merry way and do your own thing. Because if that's what you're waiting for today, that's not why Jesus came. And you are going to miss what God's purpose is this Holy Week. So when was the last time you had your vision checked? I can also tell you today that if you do not have a relationship with Jesus, I would wholeheartedly encourage you to embrace him today as this new kind of king. He came in peace on the first Palm Sunday. But scripture is very clear. There will come another day when our king will ride in power and every knee, whether they have named the name of Jesus as their savior, there will come a day when every knee will bow. 
And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And those that have no relationship with him will find themselves in eternity separated from God and his love and his mercy and grace. But Jesus says today is the day of salvation. And I would invite you today, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I would love to have a conversation with you after church today about what that could look like and what this new kind of king and what this new kind of kingdom brings. For us as a church today, in order for us, not only personally, but for us corporately, to live in what God has for us in this Easter season or in any season, then we have to be willing to lay aside our expectations and embrace God's purpose. Embrace that for us as people, individually, and embrace that for us as a church. Part of the way that we do that is we have to be willing to say, well, it can't be the church necessarily the way I want it. Because if what I want is different than what God has in mind, then we are in competing priorities. We have competing expectations. And if we're going to be the church that God has called us to be, then we have to be willing to surrender our earthly expectations and embrace heaven's purpose. We have to be willing to ask God to open our eyes. And sometimes that's hard because for those of us who have journeyed in the faith for any length of time, we say, well, we know everything there is to know. We know exactly what God's doing. Hogwash. We don't know everything that God is doing. God himself said, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So how do we expect to know everything that God is doing? We have to be willing to say, God, today, fresh and new, I need you to open my eyes. I need you to give me the kind of heavenly vision that I need to have in order to fulfill your kingdom purposes as a member of this congregation. So how is your vision today, individuals? How is your vision today, church? Let's just not plow through this Easter week and say, well, we've done these things countless times before. Man, we've had Palm Sundays for years and years and years. I've been to that foot washing service ever since I was a little kid, knee-high to a grasshopper. Wonderful, I'm glad that you have. But that experience can also be the barrier that keeps you from seeing heaven's purpose. When we gather on Good Friday for those that would want to come to that experiential thing. Well, we've never done that thing before. I don't know what that's like. I don't want to come. I encourage you to come. Ask God to give you heavenly vision so that you can see his divine purposes for you and for his church. When we gather on Easter Sunday morning, will you be open to all that God wants to happen? And I'm going to say this to you. This is to our home folks. So if you're a guest with us today, this doesn't apply to you. If one of the folks that you've invited to Easter Sunday service, comes on Easter Sunday, are you willing to take your hands off and say God can work in that heart any way that he chooses to work? Or do you hold on to an expectation, well, the guests that I've invited, I want God to work this way for that person. That's an earthly expectation. Will we embrace heaven's purpose? Will you be open to that today? So I just want to pray for you, church, and I'm going to pray for myself as a part of that. In just a moment, Holly's going to lead us in a closing song. But let's be open today and throughout this week, not to earthly expectation, but to heaven's purpose, because it's always, 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 always greater than what we could ever dream or imagine. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. I pray that in just some small way today, God, that what I have shared with your people will resonate in our heart and in our spirit God, forgive us for when we have had an earthly expectation of what you would do, how you would work, and what your salvation and deliverance means. And God, today, would you just give us a fresh vision of your heavenly purpose through your Son, Jesus Christ. God, would you give us a fresh vision uh, as a church of your purpose for us in Ravenna, and in Portage County. And God, may we let go of earthly expectations of how and when and where you might work or who you might choose to work through. And may we be open to your purpose, your plan, because it is always, God, greater than ours. Your word says that you can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. 
not some, but all that we would ever expect, Lord, you can do greater, far, far greater. And may we see your hand move and work in this place, not only this day, but in the lives of those who are here and in my own life. But Lord, may we see you move and work in this church, in this community, and in this county, and beyond, not so that we can pat ourselves on the back and look at the and say, look at the kingdom that we have built, but that we can say, glory be to God, we praise him for his kingdom and for his rule and reign, because it is perfect. Father, thank you for who you are, for the work that you've done. Give us eyes to see, hearts to obey. We pray these things in your name. Amen.